and Irish lines. And you're welcome back to Off the Ball Saturday here on News Talk. John Duggan with you through until 8 o'clock this evening. Just some sports news. Antrim have been relegated to the Joe McDonough Cup. Leach defeated the Saffrons 227 to 221 at Parnell Park. Cork lead Limerick in their Munster Senior Football semi final 110 to 8 points. John O'Rourke with the goal for the Rebels. Kerry played to Barreri at 7. Ashley Barty has won Wimbledon, the Lady Singles Crown, defeating Carolina Pliskova in, in three sets. She came through in a tough battle. John Ram and Tama de Tree share the lead on 14 under par in the third round of the Scottish Open. Porter Carrington going great guns. He is only four shots back. We're showcasing commentary of every Lions game here on News Talk. Neil Tracy and Fergus McFadden providing the call on the match with the Sharks. That kicks off in Pretoria in around half an hour. Remember our coverage? On OTB Sports, brought to you by Vodafone, lead partner of the British and Irish Lions. We're building up with Fergus and Mike McCarthy. But Neil, we'll start with you because you've got some big news uh, around the tour here. I do, John. It's funny you were talking about out-halves there just before the break because an out-half has been called up into the British and Irish Lions squad. And unfortunately for some Irish fans who would have been hoping to hear the name Johnny Sexton, it's not. It's Marcus Smith, England international and premiership winner with Harlequins. He has been called into the squad as additional cover in place or not in place sorry as additional cover for Finn Russell who was meant to be on the bench today but has had to pull out due to an Achilles injury that he's managing at the moment he's going to remain with the group though on the tour so Marcus Smith is going to be an addition to the squad as opposed to a replacement Uh, Russell is going to be out for the next three games so that is today's match against the South Sea Sharks and the two remaining warm up matches against the South African A team and also against the Stormers over the next seven days but they are hoping he'll be available for the first test if needed but yeah just to repeat Marcus Smith called up it's funny he's actually out on the pitch playing for England as we speak Uh, they're 56-14 in front against Canada Twickenham 55 minutes played he's kicked seven conversions so far in that match this just his second cap after he won his maiden cap under Eddie Jones last week he's a player who has been in form for quite some time he's only 22 years of age but he has more than 100 premiership games under his belt he's been around a long long time since since he was about 18 years of age he's been playing premiership rugby and to be totally honest in the last year or so his game has gone to another level entirely he's been absolutely outstanding and there were huge calls for him to be involved in the England squad in the Six Nations so For those who might not know too much about him, don't read into the fact he only has two caps for England. He is someone that probably should have been playing for England, at least probably probably since the end of the last Rugby World Cup. But just to repeat, he is called into the British and Irish Lions squad as an additional injury cover with uh, Finn Russell managing an Achilles injury at the moment. Some quotes from Warren Gatlin. He says, we're obviously disappointed for Finn, who I think has been outstanding since he came into camp in Jersey. But we're optimistic he'll stay, still play an important part of the tour. We have two experienced fly halves and Owen Farrell and Dan Bigger. So it's a great opportunity for the continued development of Marcus. I've been following him closely for the past 12 months and I've been impressed with how he's matured as a player. Finn and Marcus are similar in that they look to play a bit with a bit of freedom. So for me, it's a close, like-for-like like cover as we can get. We're looking forward to welcoming into the group in Cape Town. So he's going to fly straight after today's game. He's going to fly out to Cape Town to join up with the Lions players who will be heading there tomorrow, uh, this evening as well after uh, after their game against the Cell Sea Sharks. So Finn Russell obviously out of today's match day 23. Bundiaki has been drafted into the matchday squad. This is going to be his fourth game in a row. Four out of four matches for him so far. The only player who'll have played in every single game so far if he does come off the bench today. And there is another change as well to today's side, unrelated to the injury news on Finn Russell. Maro Atoji has been ruled out. He has a stomach bug. Courtney Laws has been promoted from the substitutes bench into the starting 15. He'll wear the number four shirt and pack down alongside his countryman Johnny Hill, while Wales' is Adam Beard, who made his Lions debut against the Sharks from the start, uh, from the start on Wednesday. He's now going to come onto the bench alongside Sam Simmons. Uh, Fergus, so with this news about Marcus Smith uh, being called up to the panel and to the squad, uh, I never felt Johnny Sexton was going. He's got a, an Ireland career to prolong, but I suppose this probably closed the door on any kind of speculation around that. Would you think? Yeah, perhaps it does, and I think you know the most uh, the the line that Neil said there that stood out to me was Warren Gatlin being quoted saying, you know, he, he thinks that it's a like for like. Uh, swap with Finn Russell, which it kind of certainly is. And in fairness to Marcus Smith, uh, he's been outstanding for Harlequins. What a story it was for them last season, um, winning the Premiership 
you know, winning their first bit of silverware in quite some time and coming back um, and showing great character in both the semi and, and final to, to, to win those games and eventually beat Exeter. So, um, yeah, as Neil said, he's matured an awful lot over the past couple of years and a seriously exciting talent, like only 22 years of age, over 100 caps already, like um, um, in the Premiership. Um, he's certainly one for the future and this will just be great exposure for him out there. So hopefully, hopefully he gets uh, plenty of game time. Yeah, we wish him the best of luck. And, and Mike, it is pretty much, I think, the end of the conversation around any Johnny Sexton. Will he potentially come out to the tour and, and fill a role for the test? I don't think he was ever a runner. Did you ever think he was a runner? Um, well, yeah, I thought I thought Sexton would definitely have been, you know, there. I, I thought he'd be the next person called in, to be honest. So, um, yeah, look, we don't even know what's going to happen with the, the The series is on a knife edge as it is. We don't even know after this game, you know, there's talk I'm reading about, you know, the next two games not being played and just everyone isolating ready for the test series. So, you know, I don't know how much much more rugby we're going to see. Are they going to play South Korea? Are they going to play Stormers? Are the three tests going to go ahead? But, you know, I mean, does Marcus Smith even know he's playing at the moment? He might be, he might find out by text message when he comes off the pitch. But uh, yeah, as Ferg said, it's, he's got that real X factor. He, he's very, you know, experienced, plays with a red, cool, calm, head for a 22 year old and he, he pulls the strings and you know, played in that final in the premiership which is arguably the best premiership final that's ever been seen so um, you know great opportunity for, for himself Neil yeah just give us a sense of how messy this is right now and the viability of the tour going forward to be honest John it, it does seem like they are going to be absolutely ploughing through come what may and they are going to they're going to play their matches on the scheduled dates. Whether or not they have to swap around opposition to do so, uh, that that remains to be seen. But I know there's an enormous amount of doubt and fear that games are going to be called off. But to be totally honest, from what I am seeing and from what I'm hearing, it does feel like they are they have their scheduled dates that they're set to play games and they are going to be doing everything they can to make sure those happen. Now... They are heading down to Cape Town after this game this evening and it does seem Warren Gatland hinted yesterday that they might just be staying in Cape Town for the foreseeable future and for the rest of this tour because the COVID situation in Cape Town, while it's bad all across South Africa, it's not as bad as it has been up in the Gauteng province. So they're due to be down there after this game this coming Wednesday, the 14th of July. They're set to be playing South Africa A, followed by a game against the Stormers, also in Cape Town at the Cape Town Stadium on Saturday, 17th of July at 5 o'clock. Now, Warren Gatland hinted yesterday they aren't 100% certain what way they're going to play those games. They were due to be playing South Africa A on Wednesday, followed by the Stormers. There is a chance they might swap those games around and play against the Stormers this coming Wednesday, followed by South Africa A at the weekend, ahead of the three-test series against the Springboks, which could all end up being in Cape Town. The first test definitely is going to be in Cape Town. The second and third tests are scheduled to be back in Johannesburg, but it probably seems like every single game from here on in is going to be at Cape Town and obviously as well it's going to be at sea level altitude isn't going to be a factor but the reasoning behind potentially swapping around the South Africa A and the Stormers games are South Africa A they're going to be drawing from the Springbok squad that have been training over the last few weeks and which obviously has been ravaged by COVID they have a number of players self-isolating they're trying to get that situation in check so potentially they're trying to push maybe that game out another few days to allow South Africa a better opportunity to field, uh, to field a strong team. South Africa are going to want to probably field a relatively strong team for that uh, for that A game because they've only had one warm-up match in the lead-up to this. Their game against uh, Georgia was uh, meant to be played last night. Obviously, that was cancelled because there was COVID in both camps. So that's what it seems like at the moment, John. All we really know is they're going to be pretty much playing games on the 14th, 17th, 24th, 31st and 7th. Who they're going to be playing against is another story, however. But to be honest, it does seem like they're going to plough ahead and they're going to make sure they have every single one of those games. Yeah, there's question marks are whether there's insurance. Um, they've got all these broadcasting contracts they have to honour. Uh, the game is in a perilous state financially. People will always say there's a choice, but maybe there is just no choice for the viability of the for the franchises and the, the Lions and the South African, all these uh, uh, contractual agreements that they've made. But I wouldn't say Fergus is much fun for the players. Maybe being a Lion and loving being a Lion is overriding that right now, but it, it's an unusual environment. It must not be that much fun, as Brian O'Driscoll was alluding to on uh, Thursday night show. Yeah, I think when you, when, if anyone has seen the, um, the tours, say, in like 97, where um, this, on Sky Sports, they, they sometimes show the, the clips of, of that tour that went on there. 
um, and others, uh, ones that Brian was on, and, and some of the scenes that, you know, behind the scenes when they're out with fans and, and celebrating after matches or even just mixing with people and, and seeing the countries. Like, the guys will be stuck in a hotel. They won't even be able to see, um, you know, get out and, and see the towns they're in, Cape Town or wherever. So I'd say it's frustrating for the players. But in fairness, they've reacted unbelievably well. Um, you know, eight players getting pulled at last minute for the Sharks game last Wednesday, and they still beat them by 50 points. Two players scored hat-tricks. Um, there's some outstanding performances from guys that literally got pulled in in the last minute. So they've adapted unbelievably well, I think, um, from a coaching and playing perspective. But, you know, can you keep that up for this full tour if, if, if the goalposts keep changing on, on uh, decisions and whether you're playing X or whether you're playing Y or whether, you know, you're getting picked or someone else. Um, it's tough to prepare. You know, this is a really, really big test series against the best team in the world. They will be un underprepared as well. And I suppose it makes you question the credibility of the whole thing if, if they're just forging ahead regardless. Is the branding being damaged, the Lions brand, by all of this, Mike, in your view? Well, it's hard to say because obviously you want it to happen, but you know you're just going working around the circumstances that they're currently in with this pandemic. But um, yeah, it's we, we we just it's hard to comment because we don't know what's happening in the future. We don't know if it's yeah. definitely going ahead. So, but yeah, it's I mean it can't be much fun for the players. Like obviously they're delighted to be there and representing the Lions. But I've been going down to Cardiff to work on the under twenty six nations, and so I've been staying in the same hotel as Island twenties and. Uh, I spoke to Richie Murphy, the coach, and, you know, it's tough because they can't even go outside the hotel. So there's, they've got board games in the team rooms. Uh, I mean, there's only so much Jenga you can play in the, in the team room without, you know, climbing the walls. Apparently they're doing singing activities. Um, so it must be very dull and very boring. And it's just not a tour, a Lions tour as we know it or expect it. You know, normally they'd be out, like, experiencing, you know, you know, going shark day, diving in the cages and all these things. And it's just... Yeah, but it must be very difficult for them in terms of their prep preparation, and you know, there's you know talk of Warren Gatlin naming the team, having to name the team on the bus, or or change the team on the bus, and give that information to the players. So it's incredibly tough, and I suppose they're just being as adaptable as they possibly can be, and making the best of it, uh, you know, uh, as they can. And a big uh, onus of responsibility on Conor Murray in that in that situation, especially if say they lost their first test or whatever, Mike. It's. Uh... It's hard enough as being a Lions captain as it is. It's a great honour and he's a calm guy, but it's 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 a really difficult circumstance. Yeah, it is. But I think I think in the lead-up to the three tests, you know, presuming they go ahead, I think it, everything really has been favouring more so the Lions at this stage. As you said, South Africa haven't really played since... Well, they haven't played until that Georgia game since the World Cup final. Uh, it's Lions are getting the game time. Lions are getting the minutes in the, in the legs for the players. And then with it moving to Cape Town for the three tests... That's obviously at sea level, so that altitude is going to be taken out, which is a that's a big plus, a big bonus for for the Lions. Uh, the three Irish lads in the fifteen today: Tyke Furlong, Tyke Byrne, and Jack Conan. Uh, Fergus, what are you looking for from these three lads in terms of uh, their contribution today against the Sharks in the second game of the week? I think uh, picking up from where they've left off. I think that you know all the Irish players that that have been brought on tour have been outstanding and particularly these three guys um, <clears throat> I think you know Jack Conan went over there and probably a, a shock when he was called out initially but he's shown since he's gotten there just how good he is and the form that he was showing for for both Leinster and Ireland um, was justly rewarded and, and he's, he's gone over there and been one of the, the best back rowers so far and you, you've got to um, put him in the conversation as to whether he's going to start at eight uh, likewise with Tyg at six I think he's brilliant uh He's he's been brilliant so far. He's um, he's run some great lines. His work rate is outstanding, and his you know his his threat over the ball is just unbelievable. Along with being another really good line out option because um, he's a little bit taller than a few of the few of the other six options they have. So um, yeah, just hoping for the three of those guys to play as they've been playing and to get through unscathed uh, injury wise. We got Courtney Laws now going into the second row, Mike, uh, with the. Uh illness of Atoje. Uh, do you think Byrne and uh, Conan are knocking on the door for a potential test start on basis of what you've seen so far and their abilities? Um, yeah, th the thing is, because it's question questionable uh, opposition they're going up against at the moment, I think everyone's knocking on the door. Everyone's putting in good performance performances. So that's why I think, you know, come the first test, I think there's not really going to be that many bolters and it's going to be more a case of... Um, 
Warren Gatland picking on form and credits in the bank. So you look at the likes of Owen Farrell, he hasn't had a very good season with England, but he's got those credits in the back bank of how he's performed previously for England and the Lions. And um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot of that's going to come into play in terms of the, the credits. But for me, Ty, Ty Byrne has to start. You know, I'd, I'd have him start in the test, first test at six. You know, I thought Hendy, with Win Jones out, I thought Hendy, Ian Henderson called the line outs with great variety really well the last game. I did a fantastic job, but as we know, the South Africans are very tall. They've got a very good set piece, and you know to have Ty Byrne there doing what he does, as Ferg said there with the lines he hits in his carry, but also that jackal threat and poach, being able to slow uh, and disrupt the South African rock ball, but to have him there for the line out as well to take the heat off Hendy, who'll be who I think should be calling, um, would, would be massive. And yeah, Jack Conan's played incredibly well, and I suppose today they're just looking to. Dominate a set piece, as, as, as same with Ty Furlan, dominate a set piece, like we said with the Island guys coming in. You know, do your basics well, do your bread and butter, your set piece well, and then just to be collision winners in everything they do in terms of their defence and attack, winning the game line and that aggression and kind of nastiness is what Warren wants to, to see. And, you know, we know how Warren's game plan, Warren Ball, and, you know, that round the corner and attack, winning the collisions, getting over the game line, that's exactly what Warren likes. He wants collision winners, he wants big physical presences going out and, and and dominating if i could jump in john uh, yeah. i might just have a question for for the guys there just on bundiaki who as i said earlier on is now into the match day squad uh as number 23 in place of finn russell so obviously he's the only player now who's going to have played in all four matches so far i'd be curious to get your opinions i might start with you fergus as to whether is this a good sign that Warren Gatland clearly trusts Bundiaki? He clearly sees him as a really, really reliable player and he can put him in there and he can plug him in holes wherever he needs him. Or the other part of my brain is thinking, well, Warren Gatland is just happy to use Bundiaki as much as he can early on because maybe he doesn't necessarily see him being part of the test side. I don't know what, what, side, of, what side of things you'd fall on there. Yeah, I don't really know. I, I think... The way things have worked out so far on this tour, you can't rule anything out. And I think if you're playing the games over there, playing well, which Bundy has done, you know, as, the, as he said, the only player to have been involved in all four games, you know, he'll certainly be putting his hand up. You know, if Robbie Henshaw manages to get back from this hamstring injury before the Test Series, he will definitely start at 13. And it's just a question about who's going to start at 12. I don't think Bundy would be the guy to be put on the bench at number 23 because I don't think he's versatile enough. I think that'll be between probably an Elliot Daly or Liam Williams or someone like that. So um, it'll be interesting. It's all it's all about how today goes um, next week. Um, but, you know, Bundy has done fantastic since he's gone over there. And, um, you know, Warren has, has, has mentioned in the press that he's been really, really impressed by him. And Mike, uh, Bundy is Warren's type of player. It, it, it's pretty evident now. Yeah, I just touched on like how Warren Gatlin's teams play. You know that hard, direct running physicality. There's not really too much. You know, we we all know what we're getting with a team coach by Warren Gatlin. He likes big physical presences, and what Bundy does is he gives you that off first phase ball, off line out, off scrum, hitting up hard, hitting a hard line. We saw against Japan him getting into those seams off the back of the line out. Um, looks like a tactic they're going to be looking to use going into the South Africa tests. But, you know, he gives you that momentum or first phase. He wins those inches, gives you that game line, which makes it a lot easier for everyone else to play off. And then in terms of the energy we know from his games for Connor and Ireland, what he brings energy-wise, you know, the screaming and the shouting and geeing up the lads, that's massive in terms of giving guys juice and giving guys energy. And then also in his defence, his defence, he, he brings it there as well. And we saw that, hey, I mean, I know he got done against Vunapola when, when Ireland played England, but that kind of, as I said before, that kind of physicality and, you know, winning collisions, that's what Warren is all about. So I can see why he's a massive fan of, of Bundy because he, you know, for, he ticks all the boxes for, for, for Warren. Well, Owen Farrell, uh, Keith Wood has been speaking about him on the show this week and let's hear what the former Lions uh, hooker has to say about the England captain. I think Farrell is, is a proper test beast. Um, uh, I think... To be honest, the Lions used him really poorly um, at the weekend. And um, I do want to just touch on one other thing that Niamh said, whether people have played... I don't think anybody has played themselves onto the test team from that, and you couldn't have. You can't 
uh, you can't, even if you play really well, you can only do what you can do against the team that you're playing yeah. against. You can't read too much into into that at all. You can't read the fact that some guys have been training together for three weeks and some guys for seven days that you can say that these guys are going to be there or not. So I don't think that that's a fair reflection. And Gatland has already said it, that he's going to really look at how players are training and playing mm. and doing yeah. it. But if you're using Farrell as a, a crashing 12 that's a stupid thing to do. I mean, that's not what he is. He mm. is the reason to have it, which, and we've had this discussion, first 5'8", second 5'8", in New Zealand, it's the two playmakers at 10 and 12. That idea of having another playmaker, it doesn't mean you crash him into people. There's just a pointless use of it. You wouldn't want to do it with your 10. Um, I, was just, I was looking at something on, uh, just on the same point uh, of, of, of tens. Marcus Smith played uh, against the States for, for England um, at the weekend on Sunday. Uh, he's a guy who can pass the ball like a kick and then nearly as fast as a kick. His passing is just a joy to watch. But I saw him running in to be part of a tackle and the opportunity was for him to go in and win the ruck. Um, or compete in the rook. I'm not going to say win the rook, compete in the rook. And he didn't. He stepped out and out of the way. And I was half thinking, is that a little bit cowardly? I was just going to say, that's how I, that's how I would play the game there. That would yeah. be my instinct. No. And, I, and I said, actually, no, because I don't want my 10 to yeah. be bridging over a rook and having some big hefty front row forward running in and bashing in on top of him. Yeah. I want him to be back outside, you know. And I thought, I just thought he is a high level of preservation that some of the guys don't have. And there's nothing cowardly about him because he's a fantastic defender. But um, so I think you need your tens and your playmakers to play like tens and playmakers. Sure. You don't need them to be the the, the hard carrying um, guy up. And even at 12, you might do it an odd time, but you, I thought they did it too much at the weekend. Keith Wood there and Owen Farrell and Brian O'Driscoll was also on the show uh, during the week lads uh, speaking about that Farrell has to be in there you, you play your best players and you just get them into the team and he's got that um, you know that ability and that 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 talent to to make a difference in the team um, you weren't so sure Fergus when I spoke to you last week about Owen Farrell um, in, in the 15 uh, do you still have those doubts? I'm not so sure I, I think you know off his reputation and, and you know credibility um, in the bank as that's been mentioned a few times you know you, you might pick him but I actually thought he played reasonably well I know against poor opposition against the Sharks on, on, on Wednesday but I thought from 10 he looked more comfortable I think he's a better 10 I, I don't rate him as highly a, a, at 12 but I think if the Lions are looking to play a more expansive game and a 12 that's going to be a different then yeah then you pick him but if you're if you're going to bring a Bundy a key who is so good at taking the ball up he also has, you know, a more limited passing game, but his tread over the ball and his ability to hit bigger guys behind the game line and in, in defence, that, that could be the winning or, or losing of the game against South Africa, who are so game line focused. So, um, you know, if Farrell was to start, like if I was the coach, I'd probably put him at 10, but but I wouldn't put him at 12. Would you put him at a bigger at the moment? I suppose it depends how it like Dan Bigger's probably in the driving seat because you know Wales won the Six Nations. You know Gatlin knows Bigger so well. He's been a leader for him for years. Um, but I'd probably pick Farrell at ten. What yeah. would you do, Mike? Let's bring another game or two to, get, to again to uh, attend together. I'd, I'd probably pick him. Well, I, I think it's the, the centres to start is Bundy Aki and Robbie Henshaw, and you know fly half. It's set in stone for me at the moment. Is, is Dan bigger? You know, you, you can't really judge on these the game today and the previous Sharks game because of the quality of the opposition. Everyone's playing well. Everyone's putting their hand up, but you can't judge against against Japan. That's a Test match side, a, a quality side, and you know he absolutely controlled that game, played incredibly well. So I think he's in the driving seat, and you know I suppose what Owen Farrell does give you in the senses is. You know that distribution of second second wave attack and getting, you know, the skill set to be able to make the right decision, but also execute the right pass in terms of getting around that blitz defence, which South Africa come with incredible line speed. Now that it does, the defence is quite narrow at times, but they get off with such speed and pace. You know, Farrell can possibly unlock that by getting in behind them. But you know, for me, as it stands, I think biggest to to start at ten with uh, Bundy and Robbie in the centres. 
Well, what about the pack? Devon Toner has been speaking to Willow Callahan about the work involved when it comes to lineup preparation ahead of a match. Yeah, I think I think it's different for forwards and backs as well. I think backs are able to wing it a bit more. Do you know what I, mean? I think they just pass it to the wing and and and, and or, or do a bash up the middle. But I think when it comes to lineouts, there's there's they're so intricate, um, and there is a lot of learning to go on during the week. That if you're thrown in the last minute and you don't know your liner cause, you're kind of screwed. You know, um, so I think from what I know or what I've heard, I, I haven't really heard much, but I think. Obviously, I know Robin McBride a bit from Leinster, and he, he's a he's a fantastic forwards coach. I'd say they have a simple enough lineup menu going into the game. Um, you'd like to think so, anyway. Mm-hmm. So, with, with with that little continuity, hopefully, we don't see too much go wrong. Even when it comes around to the test games, Devon, does it make sense for a team like the Lions, who are patched together, to keep things fairly simple at the lineout anyway? Because I would imagine that it takes a lot of work in the training ground a lot of games to actually be able to have an intricate system you probably keep it fairly simple do you absolutely yeah no i think so yeah um there's no point at all trying to do anything complicated because it, because it's such a pressure situation you know i mean when you get into the 22 you, you can't lose that line out because every moment you get in the opposition 22 is so precious and you just need to be able to keep um, keep possession. So I'd, I wouldn't be surprised if you see them going to the front a lot. If 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 the if the, if um, the box are given the front line out, um, it's like so the, the 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 main thing is just keeping possession. And if Hendy sees that they're leaving the front open, or in this game, or, or whoever's calling the line out, I say they're going to hit the front and just keep things really simple. That means you're on the far side. You're at the spring box. Do you go aggressive against the Lions line out then? Yeah. Absolutely, especially with the, with the team that they have, because they've got that height. Now, obviously, with Steph Detoy and Etzebeth and I don't know, Ludi Yeager and Mostert, there's, there's there's so much height in their squad. If you just get people in the air, it it, it gets in your head. If you're a lineout hooker and you see two pods getting up in the front, in the, in the middle, in the back of the lineout every go, every time, it's going to be in your head. Um, so that's what you got to do, and that's what the spring, Springboks are going to do. I think they've traditionally had a, had a, had a brilliant lineout. Um, and they're obviously going to go after them, yeah. Devon Toner speaking on uh, OTB during the week, and we got a different uh, second row now with Courtney Laws coming into it with Johnny Hill today, Mike, uh, your position. Uh, Ian Henderson did very well the other day, made 14 of his tackles, all of them uh, forced a turnover as well in the game against the Sharks, the first of two. Uh, we're playing the other one of five in Pretoria. we got full commentary here. Um, for me, is he, is he for you uh, in your team against South Africa, or does he still have a bit of uh, work to do uh, regarding pushing for a place in the, in the test side? No, I don't. I don't think so. I think he's. I think he's for me a dead cert to start. Um, you know, he's given the captaincy, which is a, you know, that's huge for more, for Moran Gatland to give him the captaincy. So he, he was going into that last game with all that pressure of one being the captain and having to kind of ge- generate the atmosphere and the build up and motivate the players during the week. But then also, also he's running the line out. So you know, that's a lot of responsibility. And I think Dev touched on it in his piece there of, you know, how much pressure does come with calling the line out of test level. There's so much extra work involved, um, you know, articulating clearly and precisely what the call is and being able to deal with that under pressure. I thought he called the line out really well, led from the front, but not just with his line out, with his, with his uh, carries as usual. We know how dynamic he is there, but also his defence and his work rate. Um, I just thought he had a fantastic game. With his calling, he called with great variety, great great options, and, you know, they won most of their lineouts. And with uh, Wyn Jones out, you know, the talisman, I think Hendy's shown there and proved that he can he can deliver uh, with calling the, calling the lineouts. Um, but there's no doubt, like Dev said there, that South Africans are going to put incredible pressure on at the lineout. They'll know Wyn Jones, the talisman, is out, and they'll be putting pods up, and they're very, very tall, as we know. So there is going to be a lot of pressure coming on at that lineout, and... Dev did mention also there that they'll look, they'll look to throw to the front and just win it. But, you know, it's quite interesting seeing that Japan game. A lot of the ball was thrown to the tail. So they're obviously, I think it's trying to create that scene for Bundy Aki to get into. So, look, they'll take what they can. If, it, if they're going well with the line out, they might start throwing more to the tail um, to win it. And just before we go to the break, uh, Neil, uh, head of the full commentary against the Sharks, the second one in a week. What is Warren Gatlin looking for out of this? Well, to be honest, he's just looking for game time and players and, and get people moving. I think... I think he's kind of conceded as well. Obviously, they, they've put up big scores against weaker opposition. And it's just I think it's just part of the year we're in at the moment as well because you have 
players away in that South African Springbok squad bubble and in normal circumstances, not all of them, but some of those players are going to be released uh, back towards their club sides to play against the Lions in those midweek fixtures and the warm-up games and that's just not the case at the moment and that's why we've had two two hammerings, it has to be said, over the last 10 days uh, or in the last week between the, the Lions and the Sharks and Look, I, I think there's been a lot of people wondering on the far side of that as well. Like, are these the teams we're going to be seeing in the United Rugby Championship next season? You know, the expanded Pro 14, are are the Sharks and the Lions going to be adding anything at all? But when you look at the players that the Sharks are missing, for example, from their from their squad, just to, to name a couple, Sia Khaleesi, Lucanio Am is among there as well. Uh, Bonky on Banambi is going to be there at hooker for them as well next season. Oxen Shea. Uh, Makazoli, Mapimbi, some unbelievable players that are instantly going to make them a better side. Uh, but to go back originally to what you were saying, for Warren Gatland, it's just a case of trying out some combinations, getting some some game time into the legs of players as well. And most importantly, not picking up any injuries because uh, we've seen Finn Russell drop out for the next couple of games as well. Uh, Marcus Smith having to be called in. And it's funny, as we mentioned Marcus Smith earlier on, I know Mike was uh, was wondering, did he even know when he was out there on the pitch playing for England uh, at the time of speaking? I think he'd kicked seven or eight conversions during that match. Uh, he did actually come off a few minutes afterwards, and I was keeping an eye on Twitter, and it seems he only did find out as he was walking off the pitch at Twickenham, uh, uh, um, Richard Hill, the team manager for England, appeared anyway to just lean into his ear and tell him the news and there was a big smile on his face as he was walking off the pitch. So, see, it did, it did seem like he actually only found out as he came off the pitch at Twickenham. Well, it was on Off the Ball Saturday on News Talk before he even knew. Um, well, Neil, thanks for that. so much for that. Well, we got full commentary with you and uh, Fergus coming up for the game against the Sharks. Mike, thanks so much for now. We'll get the recap and expert analysis from you after the game at 7 o'clock. But we got full commentary of the Lions against the Sharks from Pretoria on the way. Rugby on Off the Ball with Vodafone, lead partner of the British and Irish Lions. Listen in the car with Apple CarPlay or Android Auto on the News Talk app, powered by GoLoud. It's important to you to know where your food comes from. Isn't it just as important to know where your information comes from? It's not always easy to verify what you see, read, or hear. But now there's help. Visit www.bemediasmart.ie. Stop, think, check. Be Media Smart. Brought to you by Media Literacy Ireland. Proudly supported by News Talk. With Virgin Mobile, there's nothing.